Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to MassDEP's Combined Sewer Overflow Training for Boards of Health. My name is Andrea Briggs, and I am a Deputy Regional Director in the Central Regional Office um, in Worcester and also serve as a liaison to Boards of Health. Um, today, I have with me Leldon Langley, who is the Director of the Division of Watershed Management. His responsibilities include supervision of the wastewater programs at MassDEP, including NIPDES, groundwater discharge, and Title V, as well as the Watershed Planning Program and the Water Management Program. Leldon will be talking with us all today about new regulations that were promulgated this year, 2022, related to notification to the public when untreated or partially treated sewage is released into Commonwealth waterways. As a Board of Health member or affiliate, these regulations require specific action by the Boards of Health, as well as coordination with your local wastewater permittee. So before I turn it over to Leldon, I want to mention that we are recording the session. We will have it posted to our website in the next few weeks. Additionally, we have a second session scheduled for April 7th that will also be recorded and posted to our website. As we go through the presentation today, please use the question and answer box um, located on your screen to submit any questions that you have, and we will go through the questions at the end of the session, time permitting. Um, please don't use the chat box to submit your questions. It's just easier to monitor one spot for, for all the questions that are submitted. And then after the session, you're encouraged to reach out to Leldon or your regional office if you have any specific questions or you need additional assistance. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Leldon. Thank you, Leldon. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I appreciate everybody coming today and uh, showing interest in this topic. I'm hoping to be able to um, you know, give you uh, solid information about uh, these new regulations and uh, enable you to be able to uh, uh, help the Board of Health you know, implement and comply with them. And um, I'm here in downtown Boston. It's a little lively outside. There's a, a protest march walking by and someone playing uh, on plastic buckets outside. So I hope you, um, you know, don't hear a lot of noise, uh, but um, hoping that we can get through and, and uh, through the presentation. And then we intend to have a considerable amount of time at the end for, um, for questions and answers. So you'll have a chance to ask questions if you have them. Um, we're talking today about uh, new regulations 314 CMR 16, the notification requirements to promote public awareness of sewage pollution. And I'm trying to, there we are. Okay. Uh, so today we're going to go over um, sort of a brief introduction of the statute and particularly what Boards of Health needs to know, uh, give you some insights into these regulations, the events that require notification by permittees and how permittees have to, have to give that notice. Um, there are also requirements for the, for the permittees to have websites and signage, uh, public notification plans, and boards of health will be responsible for issuing public health warnings. Um, and we're also gonna talk a little bit about environmental justice components of these regulations. These regs are the first ones um, that I'm aware of in MassDEP um, that have um, environmental justice elements built into them. So that's a relatively new component, but I expect it to be something that you will see in future regulations that are, you know, that are promulgated by MassDEP. So just a quick overview of the statute. Um, this statute was signed into law in January of 2021. It's uh, known as an act promoting awareness of sewage pollution in public waters. And it uh, takes full effect 540 days after its passage. So that um, date, that 540 days, works out to um, July 6th of 2022. Um, there are certain requirements that permittees have uh, ahead of that uh, full of that date, uh, but for boards of health, your requirements and obligations will uh, take effect on July 6th of 2022. The statute requires MassDEP to promulgate regulations by January 12th of 2022. We have accomplished that. Those regulations are in place now. Um, it also requires that we post event notifications on our website within 24 hours and provide access to those notifications and timely updates, and uh, that we publish an annual report each May. So a um, little background on the regulations. Uh, we. Uh, had a public comment period. Public notice was given on October 4th, and that public comment period 
ran from October 4th till uh, November 8th of 2021. The final regulations were promulgated on January 7th of 2022, and the majority of the provisions take effect on July 6th of 2022, as I've mentioned. I, I wanna remind folks that the session is being recorded and uh, our intent is to uh, post the recording to our website um, you know, when it's ready so that people who have not had a chance to attend the, uh, the session today would have the ability to view it and it can be used you know, for future trainings. Uh, it could also be used by any of you who are in attendance if you wanted to go back and um, you know, refresh your memories or hear what was said about a particular item. The uh, PowerPoint presentation will also be posted to our website. In fact, um, that this presentation is already posted to our website. So I'm gonna give you just a brief overview of, of the, the parts about the regulations that local boards of health uh, need to know. Uh, when I refer to boards of health, of course, I'm also referring to health departments for those of you who you know, are in cities. Um, so the first part is that there needs to be some coordination with permittees on signage. Um, the CSO permittees need to select locations uh, for placement of permanent signs at public access points. Uh, this requirement is part of the regulations as part of their uh, public advisory notification plans. And I also wanna pause briefly and mention that when I refer to CSOs, I'm referring to combined sewer overflows. And in just a slide or two, I'm gonna explain what those are. So uh, don't feel like you're you know, lost if you don't know what that term means. Um, so we are providing some resources to permittees to give them uh, knowledge of where there are um, state owned or state controlled access points, such as Depar Department of Fish and Game or Department of Conservation and Recreation boat ramps and fishing piers, as well as state regulated resources, such as shellfish growing areas and public bathing beaches for permanent sign location consideration. Permittees will be reaching out to boards of health to determine which of these public access points um, you know, might be appropriate for posting of signage to alert people when there are discharges to uh, water bodies, um, discharges of, of untreated or partially treated sewage to water bodies. Um, and along with the permittee, you'll want to consider uh, what other sign locations may be appropriate to post. Those would be the, those that might be in, um, you know, the, in uh, local authority control um, such as you know, municipal parks or municipal boat ramps and so forth. Um, the second part that boards of health need to know about are public advisory notifications. These notifications will be sent from permittees when a regulated event occurs. And so we're gonna explain what it means when you get a notification from the permittee and what it is that boards of health are you know, required to do. Um, and part of what they're required to do, you boards of health are uh, to issue public health warnings. You'll have responsibilities to issue public health warnings and to place temporary signs when there are uh, regulated events that occur. Those regulations, our regulations at 314, 16, 314 CMR 16.09 are the section of those regulations that speak specifically to boards of health responsibilities. So here are the events that require notification. Um, and we're gonna explain what each of these are in just a moment. So the three events are combined sewer overflows, certain types of sanitary sewer overflows, and discharges of partially treated wastewater, um, including blended wastewater. And we'll define those terms. So first of all, what is a combined sewer overflow? The diagram that you see it um, shows what a um, collection system for stormwater and, um, and sanitary sewerage looks like. And uh, in the case of combined sewer overflows, uh, stormwater collection systems, you know, the pipes in the streets that convey stormwater from manholes and the sanitary sewer, which is uh, sanitary sewer discharged from buildings um, are held in the same pipes. This is kind of a relic of um, you know, older cities in the United States where those systems were combined. And um, they seem to operate okay, mostly during dry weather events, uh, conveying the sewage and, uh, and any stormwater that, is, uh, that there is to a wastewater treatment plant for its treatment before discharge. Um, 
but during wet weather events, they can exceed the capacity of the pipes to convey all of the flow. And as a result, there may be um, sanitary sewerage in addition to stormwater, which overflows the dam, which you see um, you know, illustrated in this, in this diagram, um, and discharges directly to a water body. So most of these, uh, these CSO outfalls will have, or all of them really will have some type of regulator or control structure, such as a dam or a weir um, or other device that tries to you know, um, minimize um, or prevent really the discharges from CSOs. But in more significant uh, events of uh, you know, heavier rainfall intensity, uh, those uh, discharges can occur by exceeding the height of the dam or the weir. So these discharges consist of a mix of sewerage and stormwater and uh, potentially pose a public health risk. There are 19 permittees who have combined sewer overflows in Massachusetts. Um, most of them are municipalities, but there are some, um, you know, some other types of sewer authorities, Boston Water and Sewer Commission, and the Mass Water Resources Authority. Uh, MWRA has sewer service to 61 communities in the Commonwealth, uh, but not every one of those 61 communities has a um, combined sewer overflow. There are combined sewer overflows um, in the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority, the MWRA system, only in these water bodies that I've listed under that um, heading on the right-hand side of your screen under the MWRA. Those are Boston Harbor, Charles and Mystic Rivers, and L. Wife Brook, which is located in Cambridge. In addition, the other 18 on this sign, you know, identify those municipal um, systems that have combined sewer overflows. So if you're uh, attending from a municipality that is shown on this slide, then you should be aware that you um, do have a combined sewer overflow in your community. And um, it's, it's likely that your responsibilities under this uh, statute and under these regulations, you know, would be more frequent than those who, um, who do not have combined sewer overflows. So this is our list of um, all the combined sewer overflow permittees uh, in the Commonwealth. Okay, so what is a sanitary sewer overflow or SSO? It's any overflow, spill, release, discharge, or diversion of untreated or partially treated sewerage or wastewater from a sanitary sewer system, uh, which could be caused by a break in a sewer main, a pump station failure, or a blockage in a sewage pipe. And not all SSOs require notification under these regulations, 314 CMR 16, uh, but all SSOs require reporting under 314 CMR 12. And we're going to get into more detail about which of the SSO events you know, require notification under 314 CMR 16. But be aware that boards of health are not res responsible for determining that a regulated event has occurred. Uh, that responsibility rests with the sewer authority, the permittee, um, and they would be making that determination that an event um, triggered the requirements of 314 CMR 16. So here are three types of uh, sanitary sewer overflows requiring notification under these regulations. We crafted these three because of um, language in the statute that we felt did apply to certain types of uh, sanitary sewer overflows. And so those events are uh, sanitary sewer overflows that discharge through a wastewater outfall. Note that I'm not saying a stormwater outfall, but rather a wastewater outfall, either directly or indirectly to a surface water of the Commonwealth. That's the first type. Second type is any SSO that flows into a surface water of the Commonwealth and is the result of the sanitary sewer system surcharging under high flow conditions when peak flows cannot be conveyed to a, a publicly owned treatment works uh, due to capacity constraints. So this is essentially cases where the flow in the pipe exceeds the capacity of the pipe and uh, causes an, an outfall into a surface water of the Commonwealth. And the third type is any SSO that flows into a surface water of the Commonwealth and is the result of a failure of a wastewater pump station or associated force main, which is designed to convey peak flows of a million gallons per day or greater. And we selected that one million gallon per day or greater threshold uh, because we believe that 
a failure of a pump station of that, you know, of that magnitude does have, you know, considerable potential to cause a public health threat. So these public advisory notification requirements are the method by which a permittee um, informs the public that an event that is regulated under these regs has occurred. So it's issued by the permittee. It applies to those CSO and SSO events and also to partially treated wastewater. So there are certainly events in um, the treatment of wastewater where you know, a portion of the treatment system gets bypassed. Um, that can happen when plants are performing maintenance and have to route the um, wastewater around the portion of the plant that's under, you know, that's under um, construction or maintenance. Um, it can occur also when there is a combined sewer overflow event occurring. Um, in that event, in many cases, in order to take as much flow into the plant as they can, uh, primities will, um, you know, bypass a portion of the wastewater treatment process. And, um, discharge it uh, at the sort of at the tail end of the process. And that's referred to as blended wastewater. Uh, and it is a type of partially treated wastewater because it hasn't gone through the entire uh, wastewater treatment plant process. Um, those events are regulated under the statute. And so any event of partially treated, including blended wastewater uh, being discharged to a water body, you know, uh, does require notice by the permittee via the public advisory notification. Once that uh, permittee has uh, identified that an event may be occurring, uh, they have two hours to determine and try to verify that in fact, they do have a discharge occurring from their, um, from their uh, CSO outfall. And uh, that, that period of time is considered to be dis the discovery. So they, they take some steps to verify that they do have an actual activation of the outfall and that it's not just say a faulty meter or some other inadvertent um, signal coming from the meter that would, um, that would uh, make them believe that an activation is occurring. When those um, events occur, they have to post it to their websites and they have to send the notice, the public advisory notification to state, federal and local agencies, including boards of health in affected municipalities. So, um, Boards of health and affected municipalities can include those municipalities in which the outfall is located, but it can also include boards of health um, in municipalities that are down gradient of a CSO discharge. Some of the CSOs can be of considerable magnitude and that sort of slug of wastewater that has, you know, um, has uh, live bacteria that could pose risk to public health may make its way uh, uh, downstream uh, to more than one municipality in the downstream area uh, at, at um, concentrations that could potentially threaten public health. So those notifications are um, issued by the permittee and they make a determination as to whether they, how far downstream uh, you know, they need to send uh, notice to, to municipalities downstream of them. In addition to these uh, federal, state, local, and board agencies and boards of health, uh, they're also required to send that public advisory notification to news organizations and individuals who subscribe to receive those notifications. So each permittee is going to have located on its website a method by which the um, subscribers, people can subscribe to receive notifications when they occur. Um, and they will get those notifications either by text message or by email. Um, and then they have to include, include specific information uh, in the public advisory uh, notification, and that information is included in this next slide. I'm not going to read all of this to you because it's not your responsibilities to, um, you know, issue these public advisory notifications, but you can see generally that they're going to inform people about the location and the date and time that they should be taking precautionary measures, give them a link to the website, um, and so forth, and um, indicate that it poses a potential public health threat. The permittee's website uh, will have a map of the outfalls, the summary and status of their long-term control plan. These are plans that have been required by the Department of Environmental Protection, 
uh, and also by the Environmental Protection Agency to um, you know, try to eliminate, and where elimination is not possible, to minimize the uh, discharges from, um, from CSO outfalls. And so permittees are constantly implementing you know, the terms of their long-term control plan in an effort to minimize um, those, those outfalls of CSO events. Um, it links to CSO reports, meaning how often do they activate, how much it gets, act, you know, how much gets discharged, and so forth. Um, and their website will also contain instructions for subscribing to, for, to these notifications. In addition, per permittees have to post a permanent sign at each outfall. These are already required by the, our NPDES permits, those uh, permits that are issued jointly by um, uh, either jointly or individually by EPA and uh, MassDEP. And they're required to uh, place new permanent signage at public access points affected by CSO discharges. As I mentioned earlier, we're in the process of developing, you know, a GIS layer that would enable um, permittees and boards of health to identify where some of those public access points are, those that are um, you know, those that are um, owned or controlled by uh, state agencies. There is uh, specific content uh, in the regulations that describes what has to go on to the signage. And so the number of signs and locations are to be determined through the CSO no public notification plan and through consultation with boards of health in municipalities affected by discharges. The, um, the CSO public advisory notification plans are due uh, from permittees to be submitted to us by May 1st. And so sometime between now and May 1st, you know, you should be hearing from your, uh, the sewer authority in your, in your municipality, if you're one of the CSO, um, if you're one of the CSO communities that I showed you earlier, you should be hearing from your uh, permit, from the permittee, the sewer authority, who will be consulting with you about the locations for permanent signs to be placed at um, access points. And I should say public access points because private access points are not required to be posted. The public notification plans that I mentioned are due May 1st, I've, I've said that. There will be final plans which will be due January 12th of 2023. Uh, one of the larger components of these public notification plans is for permittees to describe um, uh, how they detect and um, measure the discharges that occur from CSO outfalls. Uh, some of the communities have as many as, uh, you know, 19 or 20 of these outfalls. So um, it's not a small number in some, in some instances. And um, they can be complicated in terms of the type of devices that they use to detect an outfall and to measure the flow. Um, so we've given them some time um, to describe those and for us to, um, you know, start to review those and understand how each of these systems works. Overall, there are 199 CSO outfalls in the Commonwealth. Uh, and so you can see that with 19 permittees and 199 outfalls, um, it's not a small task to try to understand how each of those outfalls um, operates. Um, Let's see, it will also, their notification plan will also include information about the website, signage, measures to communicate, and measure to communicate rather to EJ populations, environmental justice populations. Uh, it requires municipalities, uh, permittees rather, in those municipalities to consult with the boards of health on that signage and how the signage will be mo modified for ongoing discharge. There are sanitary sewer overflows, uh, public notification plans. Those are due from about 211 communities uh, on July 6th of 2022. Now, you know, I wanna take, take a moment to kind of distinguish between CSOs and SSOs in a little more detail. So the CSO outfalls, as we've explained, are um, these the locations where sanitary sewers and storm sewers are combined. And those outfalls, you know, we all know where that we know where they exist, and um, we know that they discharge with some frequency during wet weather events. Um, sanitary sewer overflows, on the other hand, could occur anywhere in a sanitary sewer system. 
and uh, they might occur due to a variety of different things like uh, broken pipes or blockages in pipes, uh, failures of pump stations, and so forth. So um, those SSO public notification plans, as I mentioned, are from about 211 additional communities. Uh, it's not predictable where an SSO uh, would occur because it can occur anywhere within that system. Um, and when they, um, you know, those, those sanitary sewers do pose a, um, a potential threat to public health and they do require uh, posting um, or issuance of public health warnings by boards of health um, and the posting to websites and measures to communicate the potential hazard to environmental justice populations. Okay, so this term, the public health warnings, is what boards of health are responsible to issue. Uh, DEP was required by the statute to consult with Massachusetts Department of Public Health on standards for municipal boards of health to issue public health warnings. That, and so those standards that were developed through our consultation with DPH are described in the regulations in more detail in that section 314 CMR 16.09, uh, as I mentioned earlier. The public health warnings are triggered when a board of health is notified by the permittee of a CSO and partial or, or partially treated uh, discharge, which exceeds two hours of duration and um, all SSOs, and then a CSO or partially treated discharge of less than two hours in duration if the Board of Health thinks there is a risk to public health. So this third bullet was intended to give Boards of Health you know, the, um, the authority to make a decision that a uh, risk to public health is occurring and, um, and issue a public health warning even if it had not exceeded two hours of duration. Uh, it would be up to the permittee to let you know how long the duration of that um, event was. So when you get the public health warning um, that a CSO discharge is occurring, there should be some consultation with the permittee to see if it has, has uh, exceeded that two hours of duration. And then in some of the water bodies, there's more than one discharge into the same water body, more than one CSO outfall in the same water body. Boards of health can determine if they need to issue more than one health warning if there are multiple discharges to the same water bodies. That's within your discretion. Public health warnings uh, from the boards of health are required by the statute to use the existing emergency notification system, including reverse 911 call system if it's available. So that phrase, that language is from the statute and um, we are defining the reverse 911 call system broadly. Uh, we're aware that some municipalities use other types of systems to reach their, um, you know, their residents. Uh, one in particular I know of is called Code Red there may be others out there. Any of those systems that are currently in place within your, um, within your municipality uh, can be used for this purpose. If your municipality does not have a reverse 911 system or code red system in place, the statute does not require you to, to, um, you know, to implement one, okay? But if it is in place, the statute required um, the use of that 911 call system for notification to uh, to, this, to the um, residents. Information that must be included in the, in the public health warning are the receiving waters affected, the location, date, and time of the discharge or overflow, a recommendation to avoid contact with the water for 48 hours. That period of time is, um, is an estimated period of time uh, by our Department of Public Health and by you know, other states in the area who've estimated that um, uh, public health risk could it persist for 48 hours, um, you know, at least. And um, the public health warning will also contain information about where to find the closure status of beaches, shellfish growing areas, and other water resource areas what, uh, that may be affected by the discharge and might be, um, you know, locations that uh, the, where the public could come in contact with contaminated water uh, and result in some type of, of illness. 
Um, public health warnings are also, also are required to have access to translations of the warning for EJ populations uh, that lack English language proficiency. We're gonna go into more detail in a few minutes about how you would determine whether um, you're a community that has an EJ population that lacks English language proficiency, and if so, how you would know what type of, what languages you would need to translate into uh, in order to inform that segment of your uh, population. Okay, so when a public health warning is issued, boards of health must post or cause to be posted temporary signage or use a permanent sign in a conspicuous locations affording access to water bodies. So I wanna pause here a minute and talk about this in some more detail. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the uh, permittees are required to place permanent signs at the, at the access points that are identified through, um, through consultation between the permittee and the Board of Health. They, um, at these locations, there would be this permanent sign and Boards of Health may wish to have that, that permanent sign uh, constructed in a way that would give you the ability to um, post your temporary sign uh, through the operation of say, a text message system or a flashing light or other mechanism that might be able to be activated remotely. That gives you the advantage of not having to physically go to the location of the public access point in order to post that temporary sign. So those of you who are in uh, CSO communities, um, you know, I want you to think carefully about, the, about uh, the potential for working with your permittee in your town to, um, to, you know, to erect a sign that would give you the ability to, um, to implement the temporary signage requirement, but by doing so remotely, this could save you a great deal of time and effort. Uh, we have um, uh, nearly completed a sign template that we're going to share with permittees. We can make that available on our website. And on that template, we are reserving a space for some type of mechanism <clears throat> that could be, um, you know, that could be uh, used for the temporary sign purposes. Um, other methods that we've thought about where, uh, that, where a permanent sign could, uh, you know, could also serve as a temporary sign would be in addition to text messages or flashing lights that I've mentioned, could be a URL where a person could, you know, enter that URL and be taken to a website that would give an update when a CSO discharge occurred, or the use of a QR code. Now, of course, URLs and QR codes uh, are, you know, for use by people who are using smart devices. And so there is, you know, that little wrinkle there, which is that, um, it may uh, not be accessible to everyone, but um, you know, we did try to build into these regs um, as many mechanisms as possible to make posting of temporary signage um, as, um, you know, as easy as possible for boards of health. Um, however, for sanitary sewer overflows, because as we've spoken about, they will, um, you know, they can occur anywhere within a system. They're not predictable. One couldn't know where that SSO is going to occur uh, in most cases um, before that event occurs. So um, those, those types of um, events should always have a temporary sign posted, um, um, you know, in the proximity of the SSO to alert the public in the area that, um, you know, there's a sanitary sewer overflow and they should avoid contact with the water. Some systems do have sanitary sewer overflows that occur at, um, you know, at, a, at some parts of their system, um, you know, more routinely. So, um, for example, they might be at a low spot, a, a spot that sometimes gets overwhelmed with, um, you know, with flow um, at a low spot in the, in the, in the terrain. Um, but typically, SSO events are not, you know, generally predictable events. Sorry, let me make sure. Okay, accidentally skipped a slide. All right, uh, public health warnings from boards of health. Uh, we've talked about this um, reverse 911 system 
And uh, I think we've already covered the uh, information in this, in this slide. Sorry, having a little trouble with my slide advance here. Give me a moment. Yep, we've covered this, good, okay. Sorry about that. Um, the signage for public health warnings, these temporary signs that we've been discussing uh, must include uh, this phrase that's in quotes at the top of this slide, warning, avoid contact with water, may cause illness. There should be infographics depicting no fishing, boating, or swimming. And uh, the reason for the warning is to inform the public about sewage in, in surface waters, the approximate date, time, and duration of the discharge, information about where to find closure status of beaches, shellfish growing areas, and other water resource areas, uh, Board of Health or Health Department contact information, and uh, for environmental justice populations lacking English language proficiency, proficiency, there should be translation of the statement in the first bullet and access to translation of the other text. So let me pause for a moment and um, elaborate on this just a bit more. So for those um, EJ, uh, municipality, municipalities that have EJ populations that lack English language proficiency, it's only this first bullet that would have to be translated on the temporary sign. That, uh, that language is warning, avoid contact with water, may cause illness. The remaining, the translation of the remaining text that you see in these other bullets on this, on this slide um, can be provided on the Board of Health's website, the town's website, um, and that translation, you know, doesn't have to uh, all be posted to, to the temporary sign, uh, just that first bullet. So just wanted to spend a little time to clarify that um, for folks. All right, so we're going to get into some detail now about what environmental justice communities are, um, environmental justice populations, and what the components of this are. The permittee has a requirement for contacting new news organizations that serve EJ populations for their public advisory notifications. They also, uh, the regulations require language translation as appropriate for public advisory notifications, signage at public access points, the public notice of the CSO public notification plan, and this last bullet, which is relevant to you all as boards of health members, uh, health department members, public health warnings and temporary signage at access points. So there is a requirement for language translation for those, uh, for those public health warnings and for the temporary signs uh, in the manner that I described a moment ago. The uh, media outlet that serves the EJ population um, should be given public notice of the public notification plan filed by the permittee. Okay, so... Um, there are municipalities uh, that are referred to as environmental justice populations. These populations are, um, there are three criteria that constitute an environmental justice population. Uh, one of them is that it's a, uh, a uh, municipality that has a significant portion of its, of its uh, residents who are, um, uh, who are minorities. Um, the second is a, um, is a threshold for um, the, the number of residents of the community whose uh, median household income, you know, who, who is um, a certain percentage lower than the median household income of the rest of the population. And the third are those EJ populations that lack English language proficiency. These are folks that have self-identified as, um, as lacking English language proficiency. Um, in many cases, there are um, you know, homes where only one, one member of the home is uh, proficient in English language. So those have been identified um, as environmental justice populations. And um, I'm going to walk you through now some tools that will enable you to determine whether your community is one of those EJ, has EJ populations, and whether um, you may need to be providing translations into certain languages. So I'm um, just gonna click on this um, link here and I hope that you see now um, a, a table that comes up. You'll see in this table, the, um, 
you'll see in this table the name of each uh, of each municipality in the Commonwealth. And in the second uh, column, the EJ criteria, you see it has either M or I, and uh, in some cases it has E. So um, the M stands for minority, and the I stands for um, a community where the income criteria. So, for... Welton, I'm just going to interrupt you and let you know that we are not seeing the table. Oh, rats. Okay, let me stop for a moment. Thank you, Andrea, and I will reshare my screen to um, be able to let you see that. Are you seeing it now? Yes, we are. Okay, excellent. All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, starting over there, so you see in the left-hand column, the municipalities, each um, municipality in the Commonwealth is, um, is listed. The second column has the EJ criteria. Uh, for those where there is an M in the column, it uh, means that they have exceeded the, um, uh, or, or meet the criteria of um, a minority population. Um, the ones that have the I are those that have, um, that meet the criteria for income. And then, you know, if we scroll a little further down, so you see most of them are M's and I's, but then we get down to the city of Boston, for example, and it has E, and that E means that they, um, uh, you know, have uh, members who have identified as lacking English language proficiency. So I'm going to take a slow, slow scroll through this and let some of you spot your municipality and um, see if you know there's an E in that um, in that uh, column. And uh, you can uh, these links are available um, on our website. Uh, if you go to our website and look up CSOs, you'll see that we've posted the CSO template and the. Uh, the CSO Public Advisory Notification Plan template and the SSO Public Advisory Notification Plan template. And you'll find those links in there and you'll be able to play with them a little bit to see, um, you know, whether your community is listed as one of those that lacks English language proficiency. Just taking a quick, quicker scroll now in the interest of time. Okay. I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment and go back to um, the previous slide. Give me a moment. Oops. Andrea, what are you seeing now? Are you seeing the um, are you seeing the slide that I was showing previously that has the links in it? Yes, the EJ populations. Oh, good, excellent, thank you. Okay, so um, in this sort of second uh, box of text on this slide, if twenty five percent or more of the households in a community lack English language proficiency, you then need to determine whether and where at least five percent of that population has speakers who self-identify as not speaking English very well and identify the languages that notifications must be translated into. And so I'm gonna click on this map. Uh, and once I get that link to work, I'm gonna to need to stop sharing and reshare my screen. So give me a second there. Okay, Andrea, are you seeing that screen now? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. Okay, you should be seeing a uh, map of the Commonwealth that has some, uh, some of the communities shown in color. And um, if you, you know, go to this community and you uh, click on it, you'll see that it gives you some information about the block group or this and the census tract, okay? I've picked one at random. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to a community that I know has a uh, EJ population that lacks English language proficiency um, and just kind of show you how this works. Um, so this is, you know, certain tract in the town of Kushnet. I think that's not the one I wanted. I wanted a different one. I think this is where I wanted to be. Yeah, here we are in New Bedford. 
So if I go to there and click on the community and then click this little arrow, um, hopefully you are seeing in the top left-hand corner of this slide, the languages that um, you know, are spoken by more than 5% of the population. So you'll see Spanish or Spanish Creole is, uh, makes up almost 14% of the population. French Creole is uh, just over 7%. And Portuguese or Portuguese Creole is um, almost 8% of the population in the, in the city of New Bedford. Um, so that tells you that because each of those languages exceeds more than 5% of, um, of the population, that um, you would need to translate the uh, public health warnings into uh, those three languages. And uh, hopefully those, um, the communities where, you know, um, where um, EJ populations uh, are present that lack English language proficiency, hopefully they already have some language services in place that can assist you with those translations. Okay. So that's how that, um, this, how this um, you know, tool works. Uh, you can access your community and see if you have uh, populations lacking English language proficiency. Um, I'm gonna reshare my screen now to get us back to the slide presentation. Okay, Andrea, you're seeing that again, the, the slide that has the links. Yes, it just has um, both screens. It's showing your next slide, but your next slide is questions. So I think you're all right. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Okay, there are questions there. And this is um, obviously my contact information here on the screen. And also um, Susanna King, she goes by Susie. Susanna King um, uh, email address uh, where you can send us questions. Susie is one of the team members I should have acknowledged um, first of all, thank you uh, to Andrea Briggs for helping set up this presentation, as well as um, to Paul Locke, um, our deputy commissioner who is on the call, and um, uh, Susie King and Kevin Brander and John Murphy, who are the core team, as well as offices of uh, folks from our Office of General Counsel, Deirdre Desmond and Carlos Badiola, uh, and many others in DEP who have been working with us on, on the development of these regs. So, um, it's about a quarter of three, and I'd like to pause now and see if we have time now for, um, for questions and answers. Sure, we had a couple of questions come in, Walden. Um, the first one is, when is the start date when the boards of health are required to post public health warnings? Great, that, that date is, Jan, is July 6th, sorry, July 6th of 2022. So on that date, um, requirements that come into effect um, uh, are those for the permittee to begin to issue public advisory notifications. And uh, to issue those notifications, as we talked about in one of the earlier slides, they would, uh, one of the, one of the uh, entities that they would go to are the boards of health. So when a regulated event occurs, if you get a public advisory notification, then the board of health would know that it's a regulated event that requires the posting of a public health warning and the posting of a temporary sign. Okay, thank you. Um, can you go over quickly who are considered the permittees? Um, sure. So um, I don't have a list of them, but they are. So the permittees in this instance are people who um, operate and maintain a um, sewer system, a sanitary sewer system in their municipality. Um, so in many, in many places, the municipality owns a wastewater treatment plant, has a collection system, you know, a system of sewer pipes that conveys wastewater into that, um, into that treatment plant and that the discharge is located in that municipality. Some instances, there are collection systems, but no what, wastewater treatment plant in a municipality. Um, so those sanitary sewers are piped probably to an adjoining or nearby community where wastewater is treated and discharged from an outfall outside, you know, outside of the, um, that collection area. Uh, and then a sort of a third category are systems like the Mass Water Resources Authority that has a uh, broad, you know, broad system of sanitary sewer uh, that has um, pump stations and other elements or components of the sanitary sewer that occur in uh, 61 communities throughout the Commonwealth. 
and those get conveyed to the central uh, treatment plant located at Deer Island, you know, off the coast of Boston. Any of those qualify as the permittees uh, and, and would have the requirements to issue public advisory notifications if they had a regulated event occur. Now note that if, uh, if you're a municipality that only has a collection system, but no wastewater treatment plant, then you would only really have the obligation to, um, to uh, issue a public advisory notification if there was um, you know, a sanitary sewer overflow because you wouldn't have, uh, probably wouldn't have a CSO um, and there would be no, no, uh, no circumstance in which you'd be issuing partially treated or blended wastewater because you don't have a treatment plant in your, in your municipality. Okay, a follow-up question came in. Can we see the list of the cities and towns that have these systems involved in permitting process? <clears throat> let me go back um, and let me clarify what I'm gonna explain. Okay, so these, these 19 sewer authorities, these, these combined sewer overflow permittees is, is how I refer to them. These 19 entities have combined sewer overflows. So the majority of the regulated events that occur under the statute and these regulations would be uh, in these 19 communities. These are the ones that have CSO overflows. They have sanitary sewers and stormwater systems that are combined and can result in these discharges under wet weather. Uh, any other sewer system in the Commonwealth that, has, um, that doesn't have a CSO, but has either, if it has a treatment plant or a collection system or both, um, you know, could have, could have a regulated event, but these 19 are the ones that will have them the most frequently. And okay. so in addition to these 19 that have CSOs, there are a total of about 230 um, overall that have, you know, a collection system, a treatment plant or both, and excuse me, and possibly a combined sewer overflow. So about 230 permittees in the Commonwealth overall, uh, that have some, some degree of sanitary sewer and these 19 that have CSOs. Okay, and then if MWRA runs through your town with does the MWRA as a permittee? MWRA is the permittee. And if there was a, let's say there was a, uh, either a CSO event or an SSO event uh, in the, in the um, MWRA system, um, they, that permittee would be sending the notice under this reg to the, to the Board of Health in that town, and it would be that board's responsibility to post the public health warning. Okay. Would the reverse 911 notification need to go out to the entire town or only to those properties effect, uh, along the affected water body? That's a good question. Um, I don't think that the statute specifies that. And um, I'm not recalling, we, we have a uh, rather lengthy, almost 20 pages actually of, um, of questions and answers that we got from prior training sessions. Um, it's posted to our website. You may want to consult it. There are, there are a number, you know, uh, almost 20 pages of um, Q and A on that document that may answer other questions you might have. Um, I'm gonna jot that question down and uh, we may be able to just uh, post some refinement, but, I'm, um, but my um, understanding is that typically when a reverse 911 system is, you know, is activated, that it goes to all the residents of the town. And if you think about it, sort of the logic about that is that um, even though an individual may not live on that water body, right? But they might go there to recreate. And so they might, um, they might, come from across town to put their boat in or go fishing or whatever. So I think my, my answer to that would be that um, it would go to, it should go to the whole town um, because for that reason. Okay, um, and let's see. Um, someone asked if the link can be shared. So I'm going to find that while you're answering the next question. Okay. How will you get all the health department's email notice? Do the permittees also call the health departments?
So the statute required that the that the permittee issue the public advisory notification and that one of the entities it goes to by, um, you know, one of the entities that it goes to is the Board of Health. Um, I think it would be good practice if you were in phone communication with your sewer authority. Sort of the, the reg isn't constructed that way. The, the statute wasn't constructed that way. Um, but I would hope that, you know, you have, um, a working relationship with the sewer authority and that, you know, they would uh, not only send an email, you know, to, to uh, perhaps some email box that may not be monitored at that moment, but should contact you and let you know that, you know, that an event has occurred. So I encourage you to establish that kind of a working relationship with you, with the permittees. Okay. Um. So can you just kind of summarize, I know that you, you talked a lot about um, the overall responsibilities of the, um, the boards of health and the downgrading in towns. Um, what overall are, are the responsibilities of the downgrading in towns uh, once they receive notification from a permittee? Right, so let's just go to that slide um, so that you can see it as well as hear me explain it. Right, so these are the these are the events uh, when a public health warning would be issued, and I think our next slide is the pub, is the public health warning. So if you're in one of the down if you're in one of the towns that receives notice, now again you might be in the same municipality as the sewer authority, or you could be in a down gradient town, but that the sewer authority has determined that um, there's risk and therefore has notified you notified the board of health. Um, then you would, you know, use the emergency notification system, including reverse 911 if it exists, and you would include the information shown on this slide, um, these bulleted items. Uh, that would be issued as a public health warning, and then you would also post your temporary sign. And the public health warning would be translated into um, the languages where uh, more than 5% of each of the population speaks particular languages. And then if we look at this slide on, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, so if we look at this slide, the signage for public health warnings um, that first bullet, warning, avoid contact with water, may cause illness. That statement, the rest of this information needs to appear in the public health warning uh, and on the signage. And note that the portion of the sign, the temporary sign, that only that needs to be translated into the appropriate languages is only this first statement, warning, avoid contact with water, may cause illness. The remainder of the content of the sign can then be made available um, through your website or other mechanism. Uh, really, what we were trying to do there is avoid, you know, folks having to post signs that had, uh, you know, that were multiple languages that had um, that uh, might be quite large, particularly if you were using um, a permanent sign. You know, you'd have to have. Uh, language and you, you could have several languages that the, the sign would get unwieldy and um, difficult. To, so okay. hopefully that answers the question. Uh, is there a limit to how far down river an impact would be considered a threat? Yeah, I, that's a great question and there's not a great answer for it. Um, so, you know, we've talked a little bit about the fact that these CSO permittees have a, um, uh, have long-term control plans. These long-term control plans, you know, did considerable analysis of the CSOs and the events that occur from them. Um, and uh, in some cases they modeled the discharges from these CSOs and were able, are able to predict the, um, you know, kind of the extent of the um, uh, sort of slug of wastewater that occurs uh, when it's discharged uh, from a CSO. Uh, 
Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned yet, I realize, is um, the fact that, that some of the CSO outfalls do have disinfection. So um, some of them are constructed in a way where wastewater is disinfected before it is discharged. Um, that would really constitute a type of partially treated wastewater. So of course that lessens the threat, you know, if it's, um, if it's at least partially treated or if it's disinfected before it's discharged. Um, so there's not a great answer to this question, but essentially what I'm saying is that, um, you know, you, there might be modeling, the permittee might be able to inform the Board of Health about how far down gradient they have seen this, um, these kinds of discharges reach. It of course is gonna be somewhat um, dependent upon the magnitude of the discharge. Uh, there are, you know, there's a lot of CSOs where the discharge occurs, but it occurs only for a brief period of time and then stops. In other words, the water level drops below that you know, dam or weir that we showed in the diagram. Uh, and so it only discharges for a brief period of time and may not overtop at all again. Or, you know, if the, if the storm remains in the area and the rainfall intensity is sufficient to activate the CSO outfall again, it may not, um, you know, it may not discharge for, um, it, may, it may discharge again or it, or it may not. So, um, Hard to predict, not a good answer to that question, just very hard and, and not only specific to the municipality and that sort of the discharge itself as it might have been modeled, but also to the rainfall intensity um, that occurs for any particular storm and the duration of the storm. Okay, thank you very much, Laldin. That is it for our questions. Um, so we are gonna wrap up early and we will let everyone get back to uh, work. Um, and I will mention that we do have a second session on April 7th, so it'll be a new, new set of question and answers. So if you want to join us for that session, we encourage you to. And um, as Laldon said, and I said at the beginning, we will also be putting the recorded session on our website. So unless you have any uh, last comment, final comments, Laldon, we'll, we'll end the session here. I, I don't think I do. Um, yep, I just checked the chat box. Doesn't seem to be anything else um, there. So I think we're good. I really appreciate everybody um, coming today. I appreciate your attention. Um, you're welcome to contact me if you have questions or concerns um, at, the, at, the, at the email address that I, was, I showed you. Um, and uh, see if I can just put that up. Oh, closed the window by accident. So, um, Andrea, could you post that in the chat just before we depart, uh, my email address? Yeah. Or I can. Okay, it's up. All right. Thank you all. I appreciate it very much. Great. Thank you, everyone.